Hey everyone, I am Miss Hu, your physics teacher. In this video, we'll be going through the concept of gravitational acceleration and freefall. In this video, we will learn what is gravitational acceleration, the value of gravitational acceleration, and what freefall means. Now, before we get started on the lesson, first of all, let's try to make an intelligent prediction. So in the pictures on the right, I've got three pairs of different objects. Take a look and try to think which object is likely to hit the floor first if they were both released at the same time. We're going to take a look at the answer in just a little bit. First things first, let's understand what gravitational acceleration is. Now, gravitational acceleration is the acceleration due to the force of gravity. As we know, gravity on Earth pulls the objects towards the surface of the Earth. And this force causes the objects to accelerate. Now, in the past, I have had students who would argue and say, no, objects are not accelerating, they're moving at constant speed. And then they'll show me when they drop the objects. Now, if they're falling at such a short distance, you can't see that increase in speed. But just think for a little bit. If you have an object which you release from the top, initially it's not moving. So the initial speed or velocity is zero. Then when you let go, it starts to move. Remember that acceleration is an increase in speed or velocity. So when you let go, there's a force that's making the object move, changing its speed or velocity from zero to a higher number. That's acceleration. And the force that is making the object move is gravity. So this is known as gravitational acceleration. So basically, gravitational acceleration is the acceleration of an object that undergoes free fall. So free fall within the object is accelerating due to gravity. Now the value of the gravitational acceleration near the surface of the Earth is a constant value, and this is always represented by the symbol G. Why we say near the surface of the Earth is because the further away you get from Earth, the lower the value of the gravitational acceleration is. So at this point in this video lesson, we don't need to know why and how the gravitational acceleration on Earth changes. If you'd like to understand more about this, that will be covered in a separate video. Now the value of g is taken to be the same all over the Earth. Even if there are some small changes, we take it to be the same because the difference is negligible. And because of that, you are expected to know this value. However, in your exams, this value is normally provided to you in the formula sheet or the front of your exam paper. For those of you who are taking the IGCSE physics paper, the value of g is taken to be 9.8 meters per second squared. Whereas those of you who are taking SPM or A-levels, this value is taken to be 9.81 meters per second squared. Here I've got the units written slightly differently because in IGCSE, the preferred way of writing it is m slash s squared, whereas in SPM, it's ms to the power of negative 2. Now, is it possible to write m slash s squared? Actually, it is. I'm just showing you there are two different ways of writing the units. Both are accepted. Now, of course, the more accurate value here is 9.81 because there are more decimal places. But if you're doing IGCSE, 9.8 is fine. So now, let's go through what free fall is. Now, a common misconception that a lot of people have, not just students, but even adults who don't really understand physics, they think that the heavier object will fall down first compared to the lighter object because it's heavier, right? Now, that is true sometimes when it's in air, but in a vacuum, you'll find that it doesn't exhibit that behavior. Both objects will actually fall together at the same rate. If placed in a vacuum, all objects undergo free fall, that means all objects fall with the gravitational acceleration, 9.8 or 9.81 meters per second squared, depending on which value that you'd be using in your exams. The reason why the objects fall with G is because there is no air resistance. That means there's no opposing force to impede its weight. So regardless of whatever the mass of the object is, for example, if we were to compare the bowling ball and a feather and we drop them both in vacuum, with absolutely no air resistance, the only force pulling the objects down are the object's individual weight. And as such, both objects will fall at the same rate. I'm not able to take a video to prove this because I don't have a vacuum tube, 
However, there is an excellent video which is available on YouTube which you can watch featuring Brian Cox by BBC where he visited a huge vacuum chamber and he actually studied the motion of bowling balls and feathers comparing them first in air and then in a vacuum tube and the motion within the vacuum tube shows very clearly that the bowling ball and the feather fall together at the same rate. So do check out the link which I have placed in the description below. Now. What if the objects are not in a vacuum? If the weight is significant enough where the air resistance is negligible, the object's acceleration will also be almost the value of g. So there may still be some air resistance, but the air resistance is so low that the difference between the object's acceleration and the value of g is insignificant. So that's why in this case, if the air resistance is so little that it is negligible, we will find the difference between the object's acceleration and g will also be negligible. So at this point, we can actually just say the object is falling with gravitational acceleration. However, if the weight is very low, where the air resistance is high enough to affect its motion, then the object will not fall with gravitational acceleration. So for example, objects like feathers, a piece of paper, a plastic bag, where the surface area is large enough to create a high value of air resistance, and the weight of the object is not high enough to overcome that air resistance easily, and the air resistance compared to the weight is quite a significant value, then we'll find the object will fall at a different acceleration from the gravitational acceleration. So do note that at this point we are referring to a short drop when it comes to the objects. If we drop the objects from a significant height, even if the weight is extremely high, there is a slightly different motion. So to find out more about that kind of motion, that means the motion of an object that is falling from a very great height like a skydiver, please watch my video on free fall and terminal velocity. The link for that video is also in the description below. So if we were to compare the fall of both of these objects, yes, you'll find that the bowling ball will hit the floor first before the feather finally reaches the floor. Now let's compare objects where both have weights which are significant enough where the air resistance are both negligible. Regardless of their mass, regardless of their weight, all of them would fall at the same rate, which is, in this case, the gravitational acceleration. So now to prove all this, let's take a look at how the pairs of objects which we saw in an earlier slide fall. Feel free to try these very simple experiments for yourself to see whether they're true. So first of all, let's compare a piece of paper against a book and just think, which one do you think will hit the floor first? So let's take a look. The video is currently in slow motion so that we can see clearly how the objects are falling in comparison to each other. And as I'm sure you have correctly predicted, the book would have fallen down first. So both of them have air resistance because both of them have quite a high surface area. But because the book's weight is so much greater, the weight is able to overcome the air resistance, causing it to fall down much quicker compared to the piece of paper. The piece of paper has a very low weight and that weight is affected by the high air resistance, causing the paper to fall down at a much lower rate. Now, let's compare two objects where the weights are significant enough to overcome the air resistance. Which do you think will hit the ground first? Let's take a look. Did you predict this correctly? So the reason why the book fell more slowly than the bottle of glue is because the book has a larger surface area, creating higher air resistance. And in this case, even though the air resistance is probably quite low, somehow it's able to still slow down the motion of the book. That's why the bottle of glue hits the ground first. So even though the book has a higher weight than the bottle of glue, but the air resistance acting on the book has a higher effect on its weight compared to the air resistance of the bottle of glue acting on its weight. Now let's compare two other objects where the air resistance will not be significant to affect their motion. Let's see what happens here. And as you can see in this case, both objects 
fall at the same rate throughout the motion. Feel free to try this and see it for yourself if you don't believe me. When you take the video, take it in slow motion or you can take it at normal speed and slow the video down to see. So now that we understand about free fall, let's take a closer look at the graphs. Over here, I have a velocity time graph. Now, a velocity time graph for free falling objects, that means objects that are falling with gravitational acceleration, will all show a linear graph like this. So here I've got a velocity time graph, but for your information, this is the same shape if you were looking at a speed time graph for free falling objects as well. If all of these objects are free falling, that means all of them are falling with gravitational acceleration, they will all be falling with the same acceleration, which is gravitational acceleration, which, as you already know by now, is equal to the value of 9.8 meters per second squared if you're doing IGCSE, or 9.81 meters per second squared if you're doing SBM or A levels. Remember, regardless of the mass and weight, they're all falling with the same value of acceleration, which means that for whichever object, all of them will show the exact same graph with the exact same gradient, exact same values of velocities from start to finish for this short drop. So in this case, that means this graph is true for all these objects. Given this velocity time graph or a speed time graph, Remember that the gradient shows us the acceleration, which means that the gradient of this velocity time or speed time graph is equal to the value of the gravitational acceleration. So this is the graph for objects that are free falling, which means they start from a speed or velocity of zero and the speed of velocity increases as the object falls downwards. Sometimes you might come across a graph for objects that are being thrown upwards. Again, I've got a velocity time graph here, but this is also the same shape for speed time graphs. In case you're wondering why I'm putting velocity time instead of speed time, it's because normally when we study acceleration, we're looking at velocity because to calculate acceleration, we should be using velocity, which is a vector. Anyway, it's still the same for a speed time graph. So as long as you understand how to read the graph, you should be fine. So when we have an object that's moving upwards, when you throw something upwards, the velocity is not zero. If it's zero, it's not moving. The thing is when you're throwing something, you are applying a force that makes the object move. That means that the initial velocity at the bottom, just after the object has been released, there is a value of velocity. And as the object moves upwards, it starts slowing down, comes to kind of a brief stop before it falls down again. So if you're only looking at the motion from the point where the object is being thrown to its maximum height, then you'll find you'll get this kind of graph. So it starts off with a velocity, decreases until it becomes zero. Then of course, if the object falls, then the graph changes. But in this case, we're just looking at the upward motion only. In this case, the acceleration of the objects is opposite to the gravitational acceleration because the object is moving against its gravity. It's decelerating. Now remember, deceleration is negative acceleration. So what we will get is the value of acceleration that is negative g, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared if you're doing IGCSE or negative 9.81 meters per second squared if you're doing SBM or A-levels. Just like with the previous graph, if you calculate the gradient of this graph, you're going to get its acceleration. And because the gradient is negative g, that's why the gradient is equal to negative g. And now, let's take a look at how to answer some calculation questions involving the value of gravitational acceleration. In this section, I'll be showing you how to solve the questions for IGCSE, SBM, and A-level style. They're actually all the same. The main difference here is, of course, the values of G, depending on which syllabus that you're using. But in addition to this, it also depends on the formula that we'll be using. In IGCSE, we learn less formula, so we'll only be learning how to use the acceleration and displacement formula. Whereas for SBM and A-levels, you do learn more linear motion equations, typically known as the Suvat equations. If you'd like to know more about the Suvat equations, please watch my video on linear motion equations. I will not be teaching the linear motion equations in this video. I'm only going to show you how to use them. So for this question, although I've labeled it as IGCSE, you can actually 
Still solve this for SBM. It's just that for IGCSE, the questions tend to be more straightforward because less formula were learned. So let's get to the question. A stone is dropped from a cliff above the sea. Ignore air resistance. A. It takes 3 seconds to hit the surface of the sea. What is the velocity of the stone just before it hits the surface of the sea? Now, for this question, some students might think that there is not enough information to solve it. They only gave one piece of information here, which is the time of 3 seconds. Now, actually, that's not true because there is additional information, but they're very implicit. You see, they told us that the stone is dropped. So when you drop an object, what happens is that the object will start to fall under the influence of gravity. And they've told us to ignore air resistance, which means we can assume that air resistance is zero. What this tells us is that the object is free falling. If an object free falls, it falls with gravitational acceleration. A good practice to have is always to write down the list of information provided in the questions on the left side so that we have an easy reference for the formula. So we know the object is going to accelerate at the same value of g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, when we drop an object, what happens is at the top of the motion, just before it starts moving, the initial velocity is zero. That means u is zero. We know that t is three seconds as given in the question. We're looking for v, so I'm going to write here v equals question mark. So to solve A, all we need to do is use the acceleration formula, which is A equals V minus U over T. Substitute the values in, you'll have 9.8 equals to V minus 0 divided by 3. Bringing this up, V equals 9.8 times 3, which gives us 29.4 meters per second. Or you can write it as 29 meters per second, which is two significant figures. Now for B, what is the height above the C from which the stone was dropped? So we're looking for height. But the thing is, height is not in the equations that we learn, right? So instead of height, what other quantity could we be looking for that is equal to the height? That's right, displacement. So we're actually looking for S. So another formula which you may or may not have learned is the displacement formula, S equals half U plus V times T. Now this formula is not included in the IGCSE syllabus anymore, but I do know that some teachers still teach it because it is a good formula to know of. For example, to be able to answer these kind of questions. This formula is used only for constant acceleration situations where we want to find out the displacement. You cannot use this formula if the acceleration is not constant. So let's just get to it. All you need to do is substitute the values in. You've got half of 0 plus. Now that we know V is 29, I'm going to put in 29.4 because it's a more accurate value, times 3. And this gives us 44.1 meters. Or you can just write it as 44 meters because it is preferred to write two significant figures in IGCSE. So that's how you can solve this kind of question. So now, Let's take a look at a similar question, but this time it is for SPM or A-levels kind of style. And this is a more challenging question because there are more equations which we could use to try to solve this question. A stone is dropped from a cliff which is 60 meters above the sea. Ignore air resistance. A. How long does it take for the stone to hit the water? So again, just because they gave us only one piece of information here doesn't mean that you can't solve it. There's implicit information over here. Now, because we're dropping the stone and we can ignore air resistance, that means the object is free falling. It's falling with gravitational acceleration. As I have mentioned earlier, it is always good practice to write down all the information that's provided in a list on the left-hand side so that it's easier for us to refer to when we want to apply the equations. So the acceleration is equal to the gravitational acceleration, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. When we drop an object, the initial velocity of the object before it starts moving is zero. So that means u is zero. The height is 60 meters, but in the list of linear motion equations, there's no h in the list. So which quantity is equal to h? That's right, displacement. So I'm going to write here s equals h, which is 60 meters as given in the question. 
we need to find out how long it takes for the stone to hit the water. That means we're looking for time. So I'm going to write here T equals question mark. So it's a good idea to always write the list out together with the symbols so that you can identify which equation that you want to use. We have AUST. Look for the equation that has these four variables so that we can find the answer easily. So the equation that you should use is S equals UT plus half AT squared. So all we need to do now is just substitute the values in. Okay, U is zero. And anything times 0 will always be 0, so we're just going to leave that as 0. Half times 9.81 t squared. So working this out, you would get t squared equals 12.123. And solving for t, you would get 3.5 seconds. Next, to find b, what is the velocity of the stone just before it hits the water? So we're looking for v. Now to solve v, you can pick any of the other formula that involves v because you already have the values for a, u, s, and t. Always go with the formula that will get you the answer the most easily, the path of least resistance. The easiest one I find is a equals v minus u over t because some of the other equations involve some squaring or some sort, so a bit too much work actually. So if you use this, it's quite straightforward because you just need to substitute the value of a in v is unknown, u is 0, and we now know that t is 3.5. Solving this, you would get 34.34 meters per second. And that's how you solve this question. Let's go through one more example of a motion question. And for this, I'll show you how to solve it for both IGCSE as well as SPM and A-levels. They're actually exactly the same. It's just because of the different values of g, we're going to get slightly different values during our working. So I'll show you the working for both. When it comes down to it, the method of solving is the same. A water rocket is launched vertically upwards at a speed of 30 meters per second. Now, when we launch something upwards, what happens is that as it moves up, it will slow down because it comes to a stop before it falls down again. You'll see that the rocket moves up, comes to a brief stop before it falls back down again. What you need to understand is that moving up and coming down are two different motions. Yes, the rocket is making the entire motion, but just because it's the same object doesn't mean it's the same motion. Going up and coming down are different motions because going up, it's decelerating, while coming down, it's accelerating. So whenever we have a situation like that, you must count these two motions separately. The good news is that for going up and coming down, they're actually kind of like mirror images of each other in terms of values. Going up, it's going against gravity, which means that it is decelerating with the negative value of g. Whereas when it falls down, it is falling down with the value of g. The velocities will also be the same at a mirror image situation, meaning that the speed at the bottom on both sides will be equal, whereas the speed on top, of course, is zero. So I'm going to write here, zero, to remind you that the water rocket comes to a brief stop at the top before it falls back down. Now, question A asks us for the total time the rocket is in air from launch until it hits the ground. So we need to calculate the time from the bottom, going up, and then falling down again. Remember that we need to look each path separately. The good news is that we need to calculate the time only for one side and double that. Because as I mentioned, both motions are just mirror images of each other in terms of value. So let's start off first with how to solve this for IGCSE. Alright, so let's start off by writing the list of values we are given in the question. Solving this for IGCSE first, we know that the object is decelerating, so the value of A is negative G, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So U is 30 meters per second. V is 0, which is the velocity at the height of the motion, while T is what we're looking for, therefore it is unknown. We just need to use the acceleration formula, which is A equals V minus U over T. So substituting the values in, we'll have negative 9.8 equals to 0 minus 30 divided by T. I'm just going to move my face out of the way so that we can see the working. And we'll get T equals 30 divided by 9.8. We can drop the negatives because they're going to cancel each other out. And the answer we'll get is 3.06.
seconds. Now, this is not the final answer because 3.06 seconds is only for the amount of time for the rocket to move up. Remember that earlier we said that in order to get the total time from launch until it hits the ground, we need to double it. So we're going to take this number and times 2. So the total time is 3.06 times 2, which gives us 6.12. And we typically write this only up to two significant figures. So just write 6.1 seconds. Now let's look at how to solve this for SPM or A-levels. I'm going to change the pen color so that's easier to see the difference between the two answers. It's actually exactly the same method. It's just that we use the value of A as negative 9.81 instead. U is of course still 30 meters per second. V is 0 and T is unknown. Using the same formula of A equals V minus U over T, we have negative 9.81 equals to 0 minus 30 divided by T. And you'd get 3.058, which actually you can round up to 3.06 seconds. So in the end, the answer we will get is still the same. 3.06 times 2 gets 6.12 seconds. But for SPM, we typically write it up to two decimal places. If you're doing A-levels, then you only need to write up to two significant figures, so that will be 6.1 seconds. And now, let's look at how to solve question B, which is what is the maximum height it can reach? Because it's the same method of solving, and the value of time was almost the same as we calculated just now, I'm just going to show you this one time, and this applies for all three syllabi. Now, the question is asking for the maximum height it can reach, so we only need to focus on the upward motion. We know that the initial launch speed is 30 meters per second, and at the top of the motion, the speed would be zero. It is, of course, decelerating, so I'm writing here, negative g. So I'll write these values at the side here. The initial launch speed is 30 meters per second. The final velocity is zero. Acceleration, of course, is negative g, and the value of g depends on which syllabus that you are using. We're going to write the value of time in now. Let's just backtrack to the previous slide. And as you can see that the time written for both is either 6.1 or 6.12 seconds. However, that is not the time that we put into the question because this 6.1 seconds is actually the total time for the entire launch. Remember that we only need to look at the time for the upward motion and that's 3.06 seconds. So 3.06 seconds is the time we're going to use in our calculations. The question is asking for the maximum height, which is h. But again, in our equations, we don't have h. So we're actually looking for s. Remember, we always want to find the easiest way to solve this. So use the formula that is the easiest to use to get the values that we want. In this case, in my opinion, the easiest formula to use here is s equals to half u plus v times t. So subbing the values in 30 plus 0 times 3.06, the answer we get is 45.9 meters if you're doing this for SPM. If you're writing this for IGCSE or A-levels, we always write it to two significant figures. So that's 46 meters if you're doing IGCSE or A-levels. And that is it for this video. So if you found this lesson to be educational and helpful, please click like and subscribe for more free physics lessons by your physics teacher, Ms. Ho. If you would like to help me keep making free educational video lessons and lab practicals, donations are welcomed at my coffee page. That's ko-fi.com slash physicsrocks. If you would like updates on the syllabus as well as access to notes and quizzes, do check out my website at physicsrocks.com. Happy studying!